We seem to be having some technical difficulty this morning. Uh, the presentation program seems to be doing some strange things. And I'd say, I'm going to talk about a video here in a little bit, but we won't be able to show it. And uh, So this morning I'd like for us to take uh, just a moment to reflect on the words of Hebrews 7.26. It says, For it was fitting that we should have a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Now, for the past three Sundays, we've been working our way through some different passages in Hebrews. And the overall theme of all this has been just about who Jesus is and, and what that means. And Hebrews, once again, was written to uh, some Jewish Christians that uh, were possibly or appear to have been struggling just a little bit, maybe wavering in their faith, maybe thinking about going back to their old faith. And the idea that, um, especially last week and then into this week, is the idea that Jesus is above the Levitical priests that they worshipped with or that led the Jewish people. That Jesus is above that. Jesus is the priest. Because the Levitical priests were not perfect. Jesus is holy and perfect. The Levitical priests had to offer sacrifices again and again and again. They had to continually offer sacrifices because not only were they imperfect, but so were their sacrifices. But Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus paid the price and paid the ultimate eternal sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice to make us be able to stand in front of God to intercede for us, to offer us eternal life. Now, we've been kind of uh, touching on this over and over again, and it really got, to, got me to thinking this week that maybe we're at a point where since this scripture is really a whole lot like the other three that we were focused on, especially last week's, and maybe we need to just step back Step back just a second. Step back and realize that maybe we need to look at the bigger picture. The idea that we have Jesus. And even though we are not perfect, Jesus is perfect. And Jesus teaches us. Jesus forgives us, loves us, and intercedes for us. We need to really think about what that means. We need to really think about what a difference that can make in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, it doesn't guarantee that we're going to be blessed with material goods if we believe in God. Jesus does show us, though, that by faith we will have an abundant life full of God's love and mercy. So, does that mean a whole lot to you this morning? I mean, deep down, are you feeling touched? Are you on the verge of tears? Or are you feeling this scripture tug at your heartstrings? <laughs> or is it maybe one of those times where you're going and this stuff is written to wavering Jewish Christians? I don't get it. So what? What does this mean for me today? So what I'd like for you to think about is we have been told through Scripture who Jesus is and what that means. We have been told that it's supposed to make a difference. But what does that mean in our day-to-day -day lives? What does that mean when things are going rough or we're feeling lost or we're suffering or, or we're about ready to give up and we're wavering? Is it enough for us? Or do we, are we left feeling like we need more? Each of us is going to be answering that question in a different way. Each of us is going to be grabbed the right one. Each of us is uh, going to be... No, I didn't. Each of us is going to have to come to terms with who Jesus is in our lives. This isn't just about what was going on then, but it's about what Jesus is doing in our lives today. What Jesus is doing in our community today. So I got to think of maybe we needed a different version. A different idea on maybe 
who Jesus is. Maybe if we heard it from a different source. On the front of your bulletins is part of a poem or a hymn by Charles Wesley. Now, once again, it's kind of dated. It's written in language that's, or at least prose, that we probably aren't as familiar with. We don't talk exactly like Charles Wesley did, but let's work our way through this. It says, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. So in other words, Charles Wesley is starting out by saying that Jesus can help us shake off our guilty fears. Jesus can help us rise. Jesus can grace our soul. And then it goes on to say, The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. This is a pretty clear picture that Charles Wesley is saying, the reason that I, my soul can rise, the reason my soul is lifted when I think of Jesus is because he can overcome any guilt. That he can overcome any guilt. And the reason why is because of his bleeding sacrifice. And I can see the evidence on his hands. My surety stands. He goes on to say, he ever lives above for me to intercede. Now, that's kind of neat because when you read it in today's, with today's eyes, it's like, it, it almost sounds like he's talking about himself having to intercede. That Charles is saying, I'm, but no, he's saying that Jesus lives forever. He lives above and he lives to intercede for me is actually what he's saying. His all redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood atones for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. In other words, he came to intercede not just for me, but for all of us. His precious blood atoned for all of us. Now five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly speak for me. Have you ever thought about Jesus' wounds? Jesus' injuries? The harm that was done to Jesus is, is exactly what is pleading for you. They speak for you. Jesus, through his sacrifice... His wounds are crying, forgive him. Forgive. Now that's Charles saying that at a time today we would say, his wounds are saying, forgive us. Forgive us. Crying out to not let us, the ransom sinner, die. Now that's some pretty good stuff. It's basically a modern or more modern version slightly more modern version of what the author of Hebrews was trying to get at. Jesus paid the price. It means something. He paid it for each of us. He paid it for each of you. So this morning we come to church. We come to, to worship Jesus. We come to give our thanks. But in what ways are we giving our thanks? What are we truly thankful for this morning? What does that mean to you? Jesus died on a cross for you, but what does that mean for you today? What does that, what difference does that make in your day-to-day -day lives? Sure, it, it draws you here on Sundays, but what difference does that make on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday? Have you had those times in your life where You've been somewhere or something has happened and you've become momentarily overwhelmed by something has happened or the, the, just the feeling the presence of God. Has anybody ever had that happen? Have you ever had that moment maybe when you came forward for communion or maybe we were praying with a friend and you, you're just there crying? You're there pleading, whether it be for thanks or whether it be pleading to give more thanks. Those are those moments that we, that we can or should expect. 
But those are the moments that so many of us, even here in church, may not be searching for, may not be keeping our eyes open for in our day-to-day lives. And the other thing that's going on with that is there are people around you every day that are searching too. They are searching for the opportunity to have some relief, to have some glimmer of hope placed on their path. That's why it's important. I'd like for you to just think about the last encounter you had with Jesus. One of those moments where you really experienced God's presence, where your heart was touched. I want you to just take a moment and think about when that might have been or what that moment might have been, might be. And then I want you to ask yourself if you have a few of those moments that are coming to mind or any, just one even. I'd like for you to ask yourself or I'd like to ask you, did you share that with anybody? Did you share that moment so they might be able to find hope? Or did you meet somebody along the way and they were telling you they had a really rough week or having a tough time and you said, well, good luck tomorrow or hope your luck improves. Those are those missed opportunities sometimes where we, we could have said, you know, I was in a place like yours at one time. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what difference Jesus made. And the thing about it is, if we're not talking about that amongst ourselves, if we're not sharing those stories in our families, we're not going to share them on the street with somebody who needs to hear it, most likely. When we come together and we celebrate our faith together, it makes not only our faith, but the people around us, their faith stronger. It can make our families stronger. It should be a part of our lives. We should take those extra moments, take that extra time to really celebrate what Jesus means to us, to remember what Jesus means to us. Now, the video that uh, we can't uh, seem to watch today, but if you go home right now and pull up Google and you click on, there's a little deal down below the search box about thanking first responders and you click on that and there's a nice little video that talks about and it's set up in the context of what people search for like how to board up their house or how to survive in this or what when will the volcano stop erupting and it's got all these scenes from different disasters and then it finally shifts over to first responders and the first responders coming to help And it actually comes down to uh, how do you thank a first responder? You know, that's one of those things. If you think about it, Jesus invited his disciples to follow him. They spent some time together and then Jesus sent them out in the world to be his disciples and to transform the world to spread the good news. That's why I strongly believe that when we see disasters and hurricanes or whether we see a a shooting in a synagogue, that God sends people. And you are God's people. Is God calling you to respond somewhere? Is God calling you to respond to somebody in your family, or your life. When uh, the tornado hit Baxter and we were trying to pick up the pieces, I've shared part of this, but I don't think I shared this part. It was a chaplain from the, uh, I believe either the Tulsa or the Moore, Oklahoma Police Department was walking his way through the neighborhood and came up and offered to pray. Now it's kind of interesting because You know, at that time, my wife and I were both pastors and we're trying to pick up the pieces and we're used to praying for other people. But to have somebody come up and offer to pray for us, to offer to be there and to be the hands and feet of Jesus for us. That is uh, 
one of those things I didn't expect to encounter. So in other words, that is one of my moments. That's one of those moments where I really felt that Jesus came in to the, all the junk that was going on and to all the distractions and we were overwhelmed and we didn't have the, the time or maybe even the strength to pray and he came and prayed for us. Folks, you can be that person. As disciples were called to be that person. And why? Because Jesus is our high priest. We are his disciples. And we are, as a church, a priesthood of believers. <clears throat> you know, people are searching. Sometimes we're searching like that morning with Dorothy and I in the aftermath of the tornado back spring. We didn't know what we were searching for, but God placed a chaplain on our path. We had a whole lot of people to help pick up the pieces in the next few days. So this morning, think about those times when Jesus has come into your life and don't keep them to yourselves. Think of those moments where you've been touched by the presence of God or you've experienced that refilling of hope by the presence and share it, celebrate it. Give a prayer of thanks for it, but don't keep it to yourself. Because the world needs Jesus. We need Jesus. So, I guess if nothing else, remember, it's okay today. If, you, if you've been listening to the words of Hebrews and You've been hearing the same thing and you're hearing about all this stuff that he's above the angels and all this sort of thing and you're having a so what moment, that's okay. It's okay to ask so what. But look for the answer. Don't just go on. And if we are asking so what, whether whatever challenge it is, whatever problem it might be, as we search, May we find our answers in Jesus. Amen. Amen.